Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to Circle of Fellows. Uh, I'm Shell Holtz uh, with the FIR Podcast Network, and uh, four fellows joining me today to talk about building your communications career, and really delighted to say the two of these are brand new fellows, uh, members of the 2016 class of fellows, Alice Brink and Priya Bates. Great to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we're going to be talking, as I said, about building your career. But uh, before we get started, uh, people who are watching would probably be interested in the backgrounds of the fellows who are here today. So, uh, Alice and Priya, why don't we uh, start with you, the new fellows. Alice? Okay. Um, as you said, I'm Alice Brink. I am an independent communications consultant. I've had my own business for about 12 years. Prior to that, I had... Uh, work in an agency environment as well as in corporate environments including the Coca-Cola company and Conoco. So m most of my clients are in the energy business and I'm based in Houston. Great. Priya? And I'm Priya Bates, uh, ABC CMP and uh, fellow and MC. Um, and I'm uh, a president of Inner Strength Communication based in Toronto, Canada. And I'm focused on internal communications, employee engagement, and change management. Great. And it's, it's wonderful uh, to have you both on the show. Uh, we have a couple of other new fellows that have uh, joined our ranks this year, and I'm looking forward to having them on future episodes. Uh, but also Sherry Rosen and Mark Schumann are here. Sherry, what are you up to? Well, I think I'm the representative on this group that is in the corporate world um, again. <laughs> now, I work for Frost Bank, which is a, a large banking investment insurance company um, with a worldwide reach for customers, but we only have financial centers in Texas, so you may not have heard about it, and I'm really sorry you need to go look up frostbank.com and find out about it. Um, I have been uh, in uh, employee communication or some name similar to that for about... 30 plus years, and a member of IABC for more than 40 years. I've also been in the publishing world and PR and consulting and done a lot of those things. Um, so I have been not only in the financial services area, but also in healthcare and energy and nonprofit. And I've worked literally coast to coast to coast in the United States, and I've also worked um, in Japan. So I've got some of that global experience there, and I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you. Okay, so you've reinvented yourself a, a, a number of times, uh, something we'll, we'll be sure to talk about. Uh, and Mark, how are things with you? Oh, just great. In fact, I think that reinvention is certainly a, a piece of the, of the puzzle for all of us on the call, as well as a fundamental to anyone developing a communication career. It's that ability to take what you learn and rethink it, repackage it, repurpose it. So in the repurposing uh, arena, I spent most of my career at Towers Perrin and left when we got bought in 2010 and since then have reinvented a few times and find myself now spending most of my time as an executive coach, coaching leaders to become better communicators and funny when they become better communicators they become better leaders and then I also teach at communications at Fairfield University here in Connecticut. Well, that sounds like a, a great place to start, Mark, with this idea of coaching leaders. Uh, the the theme that we're addressing here with um, building your career is IABC's editorial theme uh, for the month. We're trying to track Circle of Fellows with the editorial theme of the month. And the way they've couched this is uh, it, it addresses the habits top communication leaders practice to stay relevant, manage their careers, and become trusted and valued advisors to other leaders. Uh, and, and being that trusted uh, and valued advisor to other leaders seems to me that, uh, that, that coaching would be part of that. Uh, how, how has coaching leaders been part of building your reputations and, and, and building your careers? And, and Mark, since you sort of brought that you know, topic up, uh, let's start with you. Well, I, I think that when any of us look at our careers, there is a narrative that we build, that we experience, 
at a different moments in our careers, we need to look back and reflect on what have I accomplished? When was I at my best? When was I pushing it? When was I real? When was I artificial? When did it work? When was it really not working? All those things that make up a career because there are good days and there are other days when we're, we're trying to figure out what it's all about. So I think that at, at certain milestones of time, it's really good to reflect and to say, this is the value that I bring. And now let me look at different ways that I can share that value. And that happened to me a few times over the years, most recently, about two or three years ago. And I just looked back and I said, you know, these are the moments when I really made a difference. And how can I continue to make that difference but in a different way? And how could I shift those skills that I used in the consulting world for most of those years? And how can I shift the, the outcome to one of coaching and, and the difference between consulting and coaching is that consulting is writing the script and coaching is helping the leader discover his or her own script and so it's a matter of taking what we learn and then working with people to help them discover those lessons and that's the that's I think a, a natural curve in the narrative at least I'm living that one of the things I'm really excited about is the, uh, the work that IABC has done on the career levels because what it talks about is that foundational level that you start in, the specialist generalist level, moving to strategic advisor and then moving to business leader and all of the and how we actually navigate our way through that career um, and become that leader and advisor at the end of the of uh, the program so it's you know the certification levels are going to match up with that right now the CMP um, is about specialist generalist but the next level that they're going to be introducing is strategic advisor and I think that's really meant to guide us along our career. I really like what Mark said um, and Priya, I agree with you as far as needing to push our careers further. The idea that you need to know yourself and you need to know what it is that you're good at, you enjoy, um, build on your strengths understand where your weaknesses are, but really build on your strengths. And that was one of the things that I saw have seen as my career has gone forward. Um, I entered college expecting to come out a magazine designer because I just thought that was the most fun thing in the world. Somehow I ended up a journalism degree and I was a writer, which, you know, now both of those have come in handy. But um, over the first five years out of college, I learned that really what I like to do is I like to build things. And that ultimately, I learned, was about strategy and vision. And so those are the sort of the paths I took um, through the jobs as I, as I got out of college was that was what was me and that was what was going to work for me. It doesn't work for everybody, but that was what was going to work for me. And I was able to find ways that would work. I think um, all of these things are so interesting. From my perspective, a lot of the work that I have done has been uh, coaching leaders in smaller organizations, but I found that when I'm working with a bigger organization, one of the things I'm doing is coaching the communications leaders mm -hmm. on how to work with their executives, and that lets them shine uh, in their organization, and it, it be I become sort of a mentor. Yeah, I, I look back uh, on my corporate career before I, I went independent, and it was a while before leaders were willing to listen to me. Uh, I was a, a junior staff writer uh, in, in my first job at a, a Fortune 15 company. Uh, we had 25 people in employee communications, which was part of the HR organization, not part of the PR organization. Uh, and, you know, I was lucky if I got to interview uh, a, a senior executive, uh, no less coach them on their own. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, no less coach them on uh, their own communication styles. Uh, what was your experience in, in building the kind of credibility and the kind of reputation in the organization that, that got them to take you seriously? Well, since I'm in the organization now, I'll see if I can answer that one for some folks. I, I think I have learned, and it's been a hard lesson, it was not something that can be paid easily. Uh, it was not my job to build or strategize or have vision for a, uh, an, a, a communication um, empire or, you know, the set of 
school, the media mix would be poor. How we would um, deliver all of these things out. Sherry, your 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 uh, your microphone jack, I think, is is wiggling loose. If I go without it, can you? Hear yeah. Me? Oh, that's good. Okay, so I'll start over again. Um, what I've learned is that being uh, in a in, in a personality of wanting to create you know, the perfect communication department or the perfect communication department, and all that. It's not the way to get me where I needed to go in terms of the business. I need to go back and figure out what was going to help the objective, the directions we were going, and then put communication into that, and over time, it builds an effective communication practice. But really, what you're trying to do is you're working with your senior leaders to understand what they are trying to accomplish, what they need to happen, and where communication fits into that. And that was not something that I necessarily uh, came out of the street to do. And I, and I agree with you, Sherry, that uh, there's this whole opportunity of truly, truly understanding the business and what the strategy and vision is and being able to use that communication expertise to, to tie it all up. And that's something that you learn that we weren't traditionally taught, but you learned in terms of where you got the traction and effectiveness and the respect because you were able to work with that leader to solve their problems through a communication solution. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes I think it, my, my view of this has been influenced by having watched too many movies. But <laughs> I, I think that every organization has a narrative and every leader plays a role in that narrative. And some are villains and some are heroes and some are innocent bystanders and some should be put away. And and I think that that where and I try to help my students picture this, is is when we help a leader envision what that narrative is and what his or her role in that narrative is, that helps the leader own the moment and own the relationships and own the outcomes. When when we help the leader achieve that sense of ownership, talking about communication as a way, a, a means to an end, becomes an easy conversation because we're not having to do that kind of traditional selling of our value and all that that we used to sometimes have to get so focused on. But when we help the leader own the outcome, then they want what we bring. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I find that concept of the company narrative really fascinating and have for a long time, Mark. Uh, you know, uh, engage for success, which is the British uh, initiative to bring employee engagement principles into British organizations, uh, sees the strategic company narrative as one of the four foundations, one of the four drivers right. of employee engagement. So from an internal communication standpoint, knowing that narrative and helping employees figure out where they fit in it and helping executives be the ones who tell that story uh, is 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 really important. And you know, I think sometimes we get wrapped up in this idea that we're there to uh, ferret out good articles uh, or, or or good videos to share that employees will find interesting enough to read, without having that strategic underpinning, that strategic foundation that actually accomplishes something that's important to the leaders. And and building engagement certainly is. Yeah. And if I could sort of build on your thoughts about the narrative, I think that one of the things that actually happened in my career development is the uh, job path that I took in my first five years out of college. Because I know that now the stereotype seems to be that um, millennials change jobs too fast because they'll stay for six months and then go for 12 months and then go for 18 months and back to six months for their first jobs. But I had five different jobs in the first six years out of college. So it's, other people are just to do that. But what I did was that gave me a chance to see the narrative in different places. And sometimes I think if you stay a long time at first with one company, you think that that's what business is, but if you have an opportunity to see a lot of different things, either because it's your career path 
or you're in a consulting role when you're in with a lot of companies, you really understand better how that works and how you can be a part of that. Yeah, uh, we do have people who are, are watching live, and over on the right-hand side of the screen, there is a, a tool that will allow you to submit questions, uh, and I would encourage you to do so. If there's anything you would like to ask of uh, the panel in general, or, or any one panelist uh, specifically, just uh, share that question, and I'll make sure I, I read it out and, and get an answer for you. Um, in the meantime, you know, as I was uh, doing a little bit of research uh, before we started, uh, bouncing around on uh, Google looking for uh, communications career advice, what some of the thought leaders are saying, and what some of the conventional wisdom is, I, I kept coming across this, you need to be a great writer. Uh, and, and I certainly agree with that. I think it's tough to be in the communications business without knowing how to write, and I find it a little distressing that um, I, I find it a little distressing that there are uh, universities now uh, that are teaching communications programs that don't have writing requirements uh, in them. And I, I, I also think that's relevant both on the, uh, the tactical side, if, if you're going to come in at a, at a junior level and, and produce content, but also on the uh, strategic side, uh, because you have to be able to articulate in reports what the data that you're getting means and uh, you know, make your case to leadership for, for doing what you know is, is right. Um, how important do you think the writing skills are today? Well, let me respond to that. I, I think that one of the things that we've we've done is we've sort of evolved away from calling those communication skills writing skills. Right. I think that the skills are essential, the ability to articulate an idea, the ability to tell a story, the ability to help people move from A to B to C. And those are you know, the essential skills. I think when people hear writing, they think grammar. And that is I, I think grammar is an essential skill, but it's also something that there are now tools to prop you up on. But that essential str strategy of communication, I think, will never go away. Yeah, Alice, you, I think you're so, you're so right. And, and, and I see it at in, in, in two different ends of the spectrum, in, in kids who are just starting in school and then kids who should be... Adults, and I, 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 I find that sometimes I can't tell between, and and, and, and it's all back, you know, Alice, precisely to what you say. It's that ability. One of the classes I teach is called Argument and Advocacy. And I love Ooh. the title. Can I, love I come the title. take it? It's wonderful because it's all about how do I find and form a point of view, and how. Do, but the context for that point of view is the relationship I'm trying to build. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I find that when you get people to focus on the relationship and, the, and, 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 and what I do to advance the relationship, then they see the importance of, of clarity. And so it's all about clarity. And, mm -hmm. and that clarity is the issue, whether it's spoken clarity, written clarity, mm -hmm. tweeted clarity, whatever. <laughs> The thing I always talk about is that uh, it's kind of the difference between the art and the science. Yeah. And you, uh, you know, th there are communicators who are out there who just love the art and they love the prose and they love creating, um, you know, beautiful pieces. Um, for me, it's it's the science. Is what's the result? Where is this going to go? What's your hypothesis? And and it really is a combination of both when it's done really well. Yes. So you always want to have that balance of really great art because we see wonderful, wonderful writers out there. But when it really counts and when you where you get that respect is when you actually accomplish a result with your communication. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah. yeah, I think another dimension of of writing is is staying current with the the trends uh, mm -hmm. in writing. I mean, the fact that I can write a feature story the way I was taught in journalism school in the early seventies. Uh, doesn't necessarily position me to uh, write the captions for a video that's going to be played on Facebook with the audio off. Uh, so I think there's this this need to continuously adapt your writing skills to the the channels and the platforms that are being used for communication, you know, today and the and the ones that are coming tomorrow. I read an article, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, that talked about the fact that Silicon Valley is now hiring writers away from Hollywood to write the scripts for chatbots. 
so that these <laughs> chatbots are going to sound more human and engaging and entertaining uh, for the people who are interacting with them. Uh, so, I mean, there's new work for writers, but, you know, within the corporate communications world, uh, certainly we're going to be called to called upon to you know, advise on that and, and maybe to hire for that and, and for people at uh, the, the, the tactical level to actually produce content for that. So what you're really talking about, I think, Shell, is lifelong, is, is being a lifelong learner. You may have writing skills, you may have honed writing skills, and you may have been able to produce some good text or whatever it might be at some point in your career, and that's not going to take you through to the end. You have to have that innate interest and curiosity to always be doing, learning something different, doing something different, um, so that you can create something different as you go through and, and grow with your career. And one of the things that's amazing is that the kids right now, I mean, I've got a 10-year-old and a 13-year-old, do this intuitively. They can't spell. None of my kids can spell, but the, wh how they can use the technology and the communication to get where they want to go is absolutely amazing. And I, I was uh, I had a chance to attend a elementary school film festival where where the kids <laughs> who produced this work were eight to twelve, yeah. and the work that I was seeing blew my mind. Yeah. Voiceovers, script writing, bringing it all together under a premise, whether it was creating a PSA or a trailer or a, a stop motion animation film, they were able to use the technology and get to the end result and be able to create things that, that just blew my mind. And those skills that they have in elementary school will be completely different when they're in the middle of their career. And so <laughs> you just have to always finding those new things. The skills may be different, but the fundamentals they accomplish will, will still be the same. And, and, and Shell, I was remembering and, and those threatening moments in Journalism 101, and, and one thing we learned in Journalism 101 that hasn't changed is the fundamental importance of who, what, when, where, why, and how. And mm -hmm. no matter what we use today, we're still answering those fundamental questions. And that will not change. The human need to connect does not change. And our ability to help feed the hunger does not change. The food changes all the time. I, I, I had a, a news writing teacher, probably the most influential uh, teacher I had in, in journalism school, who also taught us the three T's. I mean, this is just seared into my brain and, and, and resonates there all the time. Uh, the three T's are, are to keep it terse, tight, and telegraphic. <laughs> Ooh. Like that? I try to say that three times. Terse, tight, <laughs> like uh, uh, and telegraphic. I uh, know uh, that 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 sounds like a Friday night challenge to me. Right, and I, you know that that just keeps coming back to me every time we see oh. some some advance in in the way organizations are communicating. And again, I come back to these, you know, one minute or ninety second videos that run with the audio off, but big captions so that people know what's uh, the messages that you're conveying. And man, do those have to be terse, tight, and telegraphic. And yeah, I think, you know, if you want to keep your career on track, you yeah. have to stay on top of these these trends. Yeah. I think I think there's a piece of that though that you can get overwhelmed by all of the technology options, you know, whether it's which social media platforms are available or, you know, video editing, caption writing, you know, meme creation, any of those things. And one of the things that I've de decided in my career all along is to kind of pick and choose which are the areas that I want to develop some deep expertise in and which are the ones I just want to know enough to order it. <laughs> You know, it's like which which ones are the are the are the leisure suits and and which ones are the you know lasting trends. Well, I think that was the the great thing. You know, I mean, Sherry and Shell have taught more of us about technology than any schools we could have gone to in for mm -hmm. years. And and so if you kind of go Sherry and Shell to the fundamentals of your teaching, it has always been to look for the purpose, look for the objective, look for the outcome, and not to get caught up in the latest gadget. And yeah. it's always been at the heart of both of your points of view, and it's why 
your points of view are so constantly relevant. Yeah, actually, my point of view on that has shifted a little bit. Uh, I agree that you can't get caught up in in the latest shiny object, but I've also come to believe that you need to experiment when something comes out and see if there's something there for you. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, GE General Electric does a, a great job with this. There's a new communication app. Uh, and, and they're using it on the first day as an organization, not an employee, but General Electric is right there. There was, a, there was one called Jelly uh, from one of the uh, founders of Twitter, um, and this was a tool that you would use to take a picture and ask a question about it. What kind of flower is this? How do I repair that? Um, and the first day this thing was out, they had a picture of a, I think it was a latte, and in the foam was the atomic symbol. And the question they asked was, uh, what scientist would you like to have uh, coffee with, living or dead? Mm. Mm. Uh, and, and they had hundreds of responses the, yeah. the first day. And, you know, the thing didn't last, but I think they, they, they took learnings from this idea that you can throw out a quick question like that and get people engaged and have applied it to other things. So mm -hmm. you know, the spirit of, Sherry, you mentioned curiosity and experimentation with new tools uh, I think is important, even as we resist, uh, you know, trying, drives me crazy when people talk about having a Facebook strategy, right? <laughs> yeah. You have a content strategy and Facebook is a channel, so, you know, yeah. you avoid getting wrapped up in the, the shiny objects. And but it's, think, it's, it's, it's think, imagination, too. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> we, we all want to talk. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things when you talk about, you know, going, going ahead and experimenting, and I, I see that more um, in the, uh, particularly when it comes to technology through the agile process and the iterative process, where you're not necessarily building the entire thing out. You're putting it out there to test it with some people and see what the response is. That sounds like what GE did. I think that that's really important. I think that um, you, we have got to get beyond the stage of thinking we have to have everything completely finished, perfect, and ready before we roll it out. Right, right. Um, yeah. There, and that's, that's been true all along. I can remember 25 years ago saying, I need to talk with this about employees before it's completely wrapped up in a bow. So we've, got, we've got to start getting this message out. Well, it, it applies in the, in the case of technology. It applies in whatever case it is. If we have to see this as a process. We can't. Everything changes too fast to wait for it to be finished before we can actually do something yeah, with it. One of the nice things about digital is that uh, with print, it had to be perfect. It had to be wrapped up in a bow, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but with digital, uh, you can try it and, and then tweak it uh, and, and go to version 1.1. .1. It's also... Oh, oh. No, please, Mark, go ahead. No, I just, all of this begs imagination and that, that we imagine. And and you see something, and you imagine the ways that it can it can advance the relationship, and and that's what keeps this profession so exciting, is that whether it's two cans and a string, or whether it's some app that lets me imagine the scientist in the latte, that that's it's it's it's, it's capturing my imagination because if you capture my imagination, I want to take the ride. And that's what we're all about. And I think it goes back a little bit to what you were saying, Alice, about needing to pick and choose um, what it is you wanted to spend your time delving into and what you really didn't have to do. And I think of it, probably it has the same result, but I think of it in a slightly different way. I think of it in terms of what interests me in my life and what's going to give me some guidance on how to uh, do communication differently or better, better or something like that. I, for example, I'm really interested in, I have become really interested in neuroscience. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, looking into neuroscience and how that affects relationships and affects um, how we communicate and so forth. I've always been interested in social sciences and culture and that plays hugely into communication. It's not how you write the words or which tool right. you use to count, but it's you know the whole thing makes a difference in how you end up being a communicator. It's you know, also not, not necessarily wanting to be all things to all people nowadays, right? So, so what we're seeing is a lot more collaborative uh, learning and collaborative relationships where you bring something to the table and you bring in the right people uh, mm -hmm. to deliver the whole. 
And that's what's really exciting about what's going on. Everybody discovers their purpose and they bring their talent to that collective. Absolutely true. Yeah, I just want to remind people who are watching uh, live that you can ask questions. It's over on the right-hand side of the screen over that way. Uh, so feel free to uh, throw a question at the, at the panel. Uh, I, I want to step back from the tech conversation a little bit. Uh, as we talk about building your career, uh, I've run into a lot of people whose careers seem to be stymied, but all they focus on is communication, right? They, they go to communication conferences, uh, and they're up to speed on communication trends and models, and they've looked at the research, but they don't know a damn thing about business. Um, and, and if you ask them uh, what the strategic plan is for the organization, I have no idea how many communicators I've talked to who don't know their own employer's business plan. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it seems to me that if you want to build your career and move up the ranks and ultimately have that, oh, God help me, I'm going to use this, this cliche, seat at the table, um, that, that you have to have a good foundation in business. I'll tell you, one of the things that drives me nuts is, is when people in communications talk about ROI as a synonym for the benefit we derived from our communication, right? The ROI of this communication was employees understand this, this better. Uh, and, and that's not ROI, and they'll laugh you out of the boardroom if you, if you try to use ROI in that way. So um, let's talk about how communicators can learn more about business if they're going to be able to apply their communication skills and competencies to helping the business. Well, I, I, I think the, the, the short answer to that is take some time and do a different job and go run a part of a business or go run a business or start your own business. I think that, that part of what separates us from that reality is that we separate ourselves from that reality. And, <laughs> and, and you know, I, my, my favorite saying that, I, that unfortunately too many people have heard is this is a business, not an art colony. And, <laughs> and I think sometimes we forget that. And so unless we are at the heart of what the business is trying to do and the relationships it must advance, we're not going to be there. It doesn't matter what chair we carry to the boardroom. There's not going to be room for us at the table. One of the things I used to do, I used to work for uh, Canada's largest grocer. And one of the things I do is ensure that the teams would go out regularly to stores and spend time in stores talking to our colleagues, spend time with truck drivers and, and shipping and receiving and take a tour of the, of the distribution center. You know, uh, listen to the VP, we had VP meetings on a regular basis to talk about uh, initiatives and the, I'd invite some of my team at different times to come in and listen and listen to what was important, what were on the minds of those executives. So there's there's one thing about working in parts of the business, but there's a huge opportunity to get out into the business and listen and ask questions and, and really find out what keeps people up at night and what, it, what are the things that are really important to them. I, yeah, I think the communication group brings a real um, role bet that's between the leaders and the people out in the front line. And if we are, can go out in the front line and talk to the, the employees out there and see what their real life problems are, and we're also talking to the CEOs and the, and the executive vice presidents and, and those people and hearing what the strategy is, we can connect those every time we meet with them, not just when we do the formal communications, and then we really become part of that strategic conversation. I think that the question that you asked originally, Shell, is um, how, how do we uh, guide people to get this strategic viewpoint and understand more about the business? And in my experience, the problem has been why they should even do that. That my job is to uh, create this content, to keep these deadlines, to, you know, to keep the this part of the communication running and knowing why they should take time to do some of these other things to, to um, get closer to the business strategy, um, what the key objectives are, how they're, how they're being measured so they know, can know how communication contributes to that. That's just a bigger piece of the puzzle that 
they need to have their eyes open to to understand why that makes a difference in career progression. If they think that writing, being the best writer, being the best video producer, um, uh, ha running the best social content is going to move their career fo forward, it's just not going to get them there. They have to see the broader picture. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a really important point, I think, Sherry, and and it, and it leads to this idea of un understanding, you know, goals and measurement, because I think a lot of times we in this profession set the wrong goals and then measure the wrong things. I don't think there's a CEO alive who's losing any sleep about the email open rate. Uh, <laughs> but they are losing sleep about a public opinion and mm -hmm. action that comes from opinion. It's interesting, Sherry, I just, I, I, I learn every time you, you speak. It's, it's wonderful. And I, I was thinking about, I teach this introduction to public relations course, and I looked at the textbook and I just like had a, had a, a reaction because the textbook like had chapter one, the press release, and I just went, no, no. <laughs> Deliver me. And so it, it's interesting. So I said, no, we're not going to quite do that. And we started the class studying for the first three to four weeks public opinion and what shapes it and what people do with it. And then we worked backwards. And it was just kind of an experiment. But what my students told me that meant so much was you made us feel this profession is big. And I never thought this profession was big. I thought it was this collection of little things that people do. I never realized it had like this big impact. And maybe that's something we have to remind ourselves about, is that this is a widescreen profession and, and we have a chance to make big differences. Yeah. And I appreciate the compliment, Mark, and I can turn it right back on you because I've learned so much from you over the years. But one of the things that I think um, holds us back as young and mid-career you know, communicators is that our, if we haven't gotten a seat at the table yet, then that's often because we have a manager that is managing us to do things that are on the um, job description. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what we do, that means you work you know, an extra two hours at home at night because you're doing this research on your own to get you to that point or you know, whatever it might be is you may be measured in your job for something that is not going to get you to that point, and you have to find out how you can get there on your own. And, and, and that's where okay. you do have to own your own career narrative, and, and you do need to look at other opportunities. And this is where I would plug IABC. IABC, as I've told people for years, is the best leadership development program out there, and it doesn't cost much. Yeah. And you have the chance in this association, if you commit and you go through these different jobs to work with every personality type you will encounter the rest of your life. And you will learn the power and the importance of influence. And you will learn what it takes to persuade and to embrace and to engage. And so I think, Sherry, to your point, is so right that I, I can accept the limitations of my situation or I can look beyond. And as I look beyond and find ways to develop, this is where to start because this is such a development opportunity right in this association. Yeah. And, and I think there's a dimension of that that a lot of people uh, don't consider and that is if you do an inventory of, of the skills that you know you're going to need as a manager or as a leader, look at what you don't have uh, and you don't see an opportunity to do that in your current position, maybe there's an opportunity to do that on a chapter board. For example, I uh, remember some people uh, who wanted to take the finance job uh, on a chapter board because they had no opportunity to manage budgets I in their jobs, and they wanted to learn how to develop and manage a budget. I did that. I, I did the finance role on the district board uh, and learned a lot. <laughs> and I luckily didn't embezzle or, or, or lose anything. <laughs> and That's I did. Good. Recently, with uh, with the brand, uh, I'd had some work in my organizations um, supporting brand initiatives, but all of a sudden, I got a chance to lead the global effort, right. and now that's turned into a, a part of my career that I didn't think uh, it, it would become because now people are starting to hire me for that expertise. So, so you never know what uh, what advantages you're going to get from that experience. Right. I think I'm seeing a trend here because. 
all of us um, have done far more IABC board work than most people even realize. But that is the kind of thing that moves you through in your career as a leader. And that's where that's one of the things that is considered when you're um, under review for a fellow selection. And so that's absolutely something that people need to consider. Start with that um, finance role at your local chapter. That's a great place to start. And I did that too. <laughs> I did too. I did too. Well, and I, you know, and I think that there, you know, I graduated with a major in English, so I knew zip other than how to write. And how to go to a library. That's what I tell people. And how to go to a library and use the card catalog. Right. <laughs> and the reader's guide to periodical literature. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And I can quote Jane Austen. That's a big <laughs> <laughs> um, So the idea of uh, business communication, I had to learn it from scratch. And I said this in my, in my remarks at the fellows um, presentation, but IABC was my graduate school. And that's how I look at it. And and I did. I took. I learned finance. I learned how to. I learned how to manage people by managing volunteers before I had ever had a staff. I learned how to coach people by reviewing accreditation portfolios and sending feedback mm -hmm. um, bef uh, before I ever had to you know coach people who were working with me. And I, I picked up all of these skills, and I'm a, you know I'm a much better communicator. I do. Looking back, I wish I had spent more time earlier looking at business strategy. I was kind of slow to come in on the fact that um, I probably needed to go take some business courses beyond finance for non-financial managers, and I wish I had done that. And that's the advice I would give somebody younger in their career who has the opportunity to do that. Yeah, or, or just go take some business classes at the local community college. Uh, yeah. But uh, another issue that uh, I, I saw come up again and again as I was uh, doing some research to prepare for this was the idea of challenging leadership, uh, letting them know when you think they're making a mistake, um, advising them to do things that may be outside of their comfort zone. Uh, it was... Uh, looking uh, at, at the Melbourne mandate uh, a, a couple of weeks ago and, and reminded that the PR is supposed to serve as the conscience right. of the organization and counsel leadership on decisions that are going to reflect well on the, the organization's reputation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think a lot of people probably are resistant uh, to challenging leadership because they fear that they're going to be risking their careers by taking a contrary position. Um, how, how did you handle that in, in your careers when you felt like you needed to tell the manager or, or the CEO uh, that, that you thought they needed to do something different than what they were doing? What I found is that uh, uh, just being able to find the influencers. They're early in my career, it wasn't, they weren't going to trust me to go up and, and tell them what I thought and what I, you know, and what I thought that they should be doing. But I, I did learn to find those folks who would listen to me and be a, and were courageous enough and had the ear of those leaders um, at first. And then slowly as those, you know, you start having those conversations and you realize they're listening, you, you start making your way up uh, to have the courage to, to have those conversations as well. And there have been times where I thought if things didn't go the way I thought it was going to go, that I would not be, I wouldn't have a job anymore. <laughs> but luckily... <laughs> 99%, 99.9% 9 of the time, I was right, and and that builds your courage. But but start with the start with the conversation and start with those influencers, and you do find them. So two, two adjectives that come to mind on, after that, um, Priya, Priya is um, resilience and a thick skin. <laughs> yeah. And have those two characteristics. I think you yeah. can do this. Fortunately, I do, and so I've. <laughs> I've had time, I've had opportunities to do this, but yes, I mean, when when you challenge, you're not going to win all of the time. And if you can deal with that, go back up and come in and do it again, you're going to have an opportunity to do it. I think that I have found, just in my situation, the way that I can usually get to uh, a point of challenge that is not viewed as a challenge um, is what really makes a difference. It's not viewed as 
the fact that I'm challenging you. It's viewed as the fact that I bring a specific piece of knowledge or experience or something like that that you may not have heard yet. So let me give you my idea on this. And it's often something that's related to people instead of numbers or you know something like that. That people are receptive to that and they they'll go with you on it. They might even be in charge of it. Yeah, I, I, I laugh because I, I just tell people I'm not chubby. I just have thick skin. <laughs> so um, I, I, I think that, um, that this continuity between us is, is very clear. And I, I, I make this point when, when I coach, and that is I think we can say anything if we have built the context. Mm -hmm. And context is essential to communication. And context is essential to the ability to challenge. Because when we build the context, we create an expectation that no matter what I may say, you'll know from where it's coming. And you'll know that it's coming from a place of support and a place of curiosity or a place of, of interest and a place of endorsement. That gives me the freedom then to challenge anything. And I, I, I think that we are the best challengers because we understand how humans react to moments. And the best we can anticipate those reactions, the clearly, the, the most effectively we can challenge anyone, I think. Yeah. I, I think that's really true. And, and part of that is, you know, we're communicating to the leader the expected reaction based on the right. action they're about to take. But we're also able to predict that leader's reaction Right. Because we know those things, and so we can um, phrase our or or direct our feedback or comments in a way that is is very positive, and you know, with the idea that I I understand where you're trying to go, and I and I think you're absolutely right. I think that it you know it might be a more effective way to get there, or you might have this reaction if you know, and just do it in a in a non-threatening way. Yeah, we've been we've been talking so far about building your career within an organization, uh, but a lot of people want to advance their career by moving to another organization uh, different than the one they're already in. Uh, so when you apply for that job and the recruiter or the communicator, the hiring manager uh, starts looking at, at your CV um, and doing a little research on you, uh, what do you hope they find? I mean, you know, what 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 happens when they Google you? Uh, and <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder how important it is to do things like write posts on LinkedIn and get out and do speaking engagements, uh, so that you you build up that personal brand that becomes so important when you're marketing yourself to a, a hiring manager or a recruiter. Well, I'll start by saying that. I do all of those things. I write posts and I um, give presentations in all sorts of different venues. And I've had many jobs over my career. And I cannot think of a single one of them that happened any other way than somebody I knew recommended me for the job and probably 90% of the time, they were people through IADC who recommended me for the job. So it really is not just um, putting your brand out there and living your brand with people every day from day to day, and they, they want to recommend you. Yeah. I, I don't do as much in the way of posting as I think I should. I do public speaking, but I think that um, posting can really uh, magnify your voice and I intend to do more of that going forward but I do think that it's important to know what your social profile is as well as to expand your one-on-one -on -one network. Yeah. And also thinking of your reputation in general, like part of it's that, that reputation socially, but there's also what's what's happening from a word of mouth perspective. And we've talked a little bit about volunteering. That if you give everything to your volunteer experience, 
um, it, that'll be a positive reference, but I've, there's many people I've volunteered with that I wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole right. <laughs> because, because it was, it wasn't the same experience. It wasn't the experience that I expected. Yeah. And, and so I always, uh, you know, whenever I'm talking to, uh, or mentoring, uh, uh, new communicators, I, I say, I tell them to volunteer, but I also uh, tell them to think about what they're willing to give because that could impact their their reputation positively or negatively based on how they manage. But, but I do think that this is a matter of balance and um, yeah. I, I mean I love to speak and I, I love to do that and I love to write. What I have found though there were moments over the years where I was so busy speaking and so busy writing that I wasn't spending enough time thinking. Mm. And, and I think that we have to protect that time for ourselves to, to stay current, not only with what's happening in the world, but to stay current with what's happening within ourselves and our curiosity and what we believe. Mm -hmm. Now, you talked about whether, you know, if a, a potential employer Googles you, but everybody should be Googling themselves on a regular basis to make sure nothing. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and here's a trick. When you Google yourself, do it in incognito mode if you're using Chrome, oh. because then you're not logged in and you find out what a stranger uh, is going to see when they Google right. you as opposed to Google already knowing your preferences and your profile and delivering what it thinks you want to see. Aha. Uh -huh. So good. Good that's point. Just, just a good little trick there. But, you know, Sherry, getting back to your point, I, the network is vital. Uh, the, a lot of the jobs that I've had have come through recommendations. Uh, but I guess the question is how do you network in order to build those relationships? And a lot of them, uh, you know, I, mean, I mean, certainly many of the relationships I've developed have come through people I have worked with, uh, both on a job and through IABC. Uh, or some of the other organizations I've been involved with, but a lot of it has come from um, people who got in touch with me after I wrote a post, or people who have seen me speak. Um, or read your books. Right, and <laughs> you know, I, I, I have been, oh, I'd say for the last six months getting more involved in commenting in some of the communications groups Ooh. on LinkedIn, and I suddenly find more people checking my profile out on LinkedIn, and there are people who are participants in these groups. Uh, yeah, I think that's also a way to build that network that can lead to that personal recommendation. Yeah, well, oh, I think, Shell, because your expertise is in technology, you better be using it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the groups I'm talking to are employee communications and engagement yeah. groups, so it's, yeah. it's, okay. conversations aren't so much about technology. Okay. And that may be true, Shell, because you are in a consultant role, and I am not in a consultant role now. So that, I'm sure, pays off for you uh, in terms of people seeking you out. The, the equivalent that I would compare it to is how many um, headhunter calls I get. And mm -hmm. they may be coming off of speaking or the posting or something like that. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it, does, it does do... It does do a good job of getting your brain, your brand, and your skills out there. Yeah, and I think that you know one of the sort of it goes without saying things that I'll say anyway is uh, that, <laughs> that you know every time you post, you are representing your brand and your reputation, and so you need to manage that and yep. manage what you say. Well, we, uh, we're down to about seven or eight minutes left uh, wow, in uh, the panel. Oh, yeah, it, it sails right by. Uh, <laughs> for those who are watching, this is your last chance uh, to ask a question uh, over on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, so if, if you have a burning question about managing your career, guiding your career, now's the time. Um, how important is it to build good relationships with people outside of the communication profession inside your organization? Uh, this was something I learned a little late in my corporate career, uh, but in, in my last corporate job, the first thing I did was uh, went over and, and, and met with the, the general counsel, I met with the head of IT, I met with the head of HR, uh, and sort of initiated relationships where not only did they know they could call me when they had a communication challenge, but they would be willing to listen to me uh, when I suggested that the approach they were taking to something was going to have you know, not great repercussions uh, from a communication perspective. Well, I, I think it's essential. In fact, one of the things um, I, I, I do with the people I coach is, 
is the proactive relationship map where you you draw a map through the organization and you say I ha I need this relationship and this relationship and this and then how do you proactively build those relationships mm -hmm. so that we don't wait to bump into somebody in the hallway or we don't wait for that that spontaneous moment we instead schedule our spontaneity and and we we proactively build the relationships outside of the comfort zone i think show your points essential mm -hmm. i think and that's very true the first 90 days on the job um, when people say well what what do i do when i walk in and i don't have a whole lot of work yet well you do have a whole lot of work I and mean, that's when you get out and start talking mm -hmm. to people and somebody will just randomly say oh so you could help me with such and such. Yes. Shall we meet, you know, two o'clock tomorrow afternoon and do it? And so those sorts of things then build up to where you think, wow, I really ever was at the point that I didn't have a whole lot to do in this job now that I need to clone myself. So, but it really does make a difference because you, you do build those relationships and the work is directly with the people who need help solving a business problem as opposed to Oh, I can write an, ar an article and post on our uh, uh, e email newsletter about what your department does. And that's you don't want to be in that trap. You want to be out there solving problems for people. When right. I, when I uh, one of my clients brought me in house for a couple of years, and one of the first projects I had was to write a speech for the CEO, and it was to the industry association. And I found that the safety uh, manager was very active in that association. So I called him up and I introduced myself and I said, I want to meet with you. I'm writing this speech. Mm -hmm. And I met with him and not only did we build a relationship, but he had the insight into that particular event. And he gave me a clue about why, it was, why that event was significant that enabled me to build the speech around that. And I suddenly looked so brilliant. <laughs> and I, I gave him credit for helping me, uh, but it, that built a relationship that we had that re, you know remained strong for the two years that I was in house there. And the other thing I did that that reminds me of is I went to the industry association office and I met with those people. It happened that our our CEO was the that year's chair of the association, so it was very relevant. But I think it's important to look at those important external relationships for your organization and be familiar with them as well as building the internal relationships. And thinking about it in terms of long-term relationships, one of the things that my husband laughs at me is I've stayed in touch with every single one of my bosses since mm -hmm. I started. <laughs> and they've been mentors, they've been, you know, it's, sometimes it's giving them a call once a year or meeting yeah. for coffee, but I'll tell you when all of a sudden I decided to leave the corporate world and I was on my own and there was nobody there. <laughs> It yeah. was really great to rely on those people to, to to help me through that transition process and just have an ear and and somebody who was there for support and and now it's uh, again it eventually leads to business because you've got these relationships that aren't just inside communication but are in the HR world and in, in the IT world and with marketers and and they've all moved on to other organizations so it really it's just relationship building in general, you get so much out of it personally in terms of learning and growth, but it also can help you out as well. Yeah. Yeah, I just I, had lunch a couple of months ago with my boss from a job that I had, uh, oh, um, 30 years ago. Uh, he's in his 80s and, and retired, and, and he and his wife were just traveling down here. But I remember, you know, he wasn't a communicator. I reported to him, but he worked in organization development. Um, and I thought reporting to somebody who didn't do what I did was uh, a great experience. I ended up going to ASTD meetings, American Society for Training and Development. Um, I, it really helped sort of flesh out my competencies by, by having that perspective on things. Yeah. So we're, uh, we're out of time. Uh, we have one minute left uh, in the broadcast, so I want to you know, thank everybody for participating. Those of you who are watching live, thank you for being here to... Uh, watch us in real time. This will be available in both uh, recorded video and as an audio podcast uh, a, a little later today. Uh, next month, we don't have a date set yet. That'll be uh, coming out soon, but the uh, editorial uh, advisory board has designated the topic for uh, July, uh, social issue development and communication. And I think this is a big one because 
as you may know, uh, organizations are being held, uh, their feet are being held to the fire these days uh, for taking positions on societal issues, something that organizations assiduously avoided uh, up until very recently. So I think that'll be uh, a, a great conversation. So uh, we'll be announcing the date and the panel uh, within the next week or two. Um, and until then, I hope everybody has a great rest of the week and a, a wonderful 4th of July weekend for those of you in the U.S. Um, Priya, uh, just have a great weekend. <laughs> all talk. right. Thank you. This is fun. Thank you, everybody. Talk, talk to you all soon. Bye. Okay, bye. bye. Thank you.